terms of where class was, so I guess I'll stay with you guys. It's good to be with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, as we travel around, Wendy and I, around our churches of our convention. Uh, I'll have to admit you guys are uh, definitely one of the most pleasant, not only in location, but absolutely in, in your personality and in who you are, and we appreciate that. Um, I do bring you greetings, though, from our other churches in the convention, 147 sister churches alongside of you in this work. Sometimes I'm asked as I travel around before we engage in God's Word, who, who are we actually? So I don't mind taking just a second and share with you again. Uh, whenever you think about our churches and our convention, not only are we located in the major Hawaiian islands, but also uh, throughout the South Pacific and Asia, working together and doing some great work. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, praying for you, looking always to partner together with you, uh, engaging in the same work in the same field. Whenever I think about our churches and realizing that we do cover such a large geographical area, as a matter of fact, our churches stretch, uh, as I made mention, from our Hawaiian islands here down through American Samoa, Western Samoa, Guam, Saipan, Okinawa, Korea, and Japan. We cover more geography than the, uh, than the continental U.S., but we're close-knit. You may not feel that always, but it is indeed a blessing, and it's great to know that any time you have a need, uh, I'll be more than happy to help facilitate and connect you with our other churches, not only here on the Big Island, but also across our convention, as well as your role in supporting and assisting them. So however you feel led to serve, I'm here to help facilitate that, and it's my pleasure to be with you. And I do want to say thank you for whoever put the pictures together. Man, I've not looked that young in years, but praise the Lord, I saw my picture up there and I thought, man, i got to get a copy of that, wherever that came from. I'm not going to update my photo. I'm going to try to update myself and see if I can get to looking like that again. Probably, yeah, I might need to update my photo. Join with me, if you will, in your copy of God's Word. New Testament book of Colossians. Now, the book of Colossians is an, uh, an amazing book. It speaks in some theological depth in the beginning, the first chapter of Colossians. Paul is writing. He talks so much about who Jesus is and the importance of understanding Jesus as God. And as he brings that full theological power through that first chapter, there's so much to glean there. But when he begins to move into the second chapter, he talks about who we are in this relationship with Christ. And, and I think it's important that he staged it that way. He wanted us first to understand who Jesus was so that we could hold firm in, in that knowledge that He is indeed everything that Scripture laid out for Him to be, the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Him, all the way to the full understanding whenever you talk about Creator and Sustainer. So many of those are pulled out in Colossians chapter 1. And then He says, and with all of that magnificent one, He's the one you walk with every day. He's the one who knows you. He's the one who you are growing in your relationship with. It's important for us to start with that because if he would have just said, you need to grow in Jesus, we, we probably would see a, a, a set of empty faces. And I want to use that to, to illustrate something if I can for you. For all of us, as we're working to engage our communities around us, be mindful of everything we say and everything we do. And every once in a while, you need to look at it again from the outside from someone who doesn't know a lot about the Bible or a lot about Jesus because many times that's who we're reaching on the outside. And you have to help them grow. You know, sometimes uh, we can put a whole lot of church language in things that, that an outside person may not even grasp. So see, it's the same way what Paul is teaching to the church in Colossians. He begins by saying who Jesus is and how important He is and all that is contained within Him. And then whenever he says, and now I want to connect you to Him, it makes sense. It clicks. If he would have just started by saying, I want to connect you to Him, or, or you need to go ahead and understand some of this stuff in advance, we'd be lost. That's the reason why when he gets into verse 2, he talks about being built up in Christ. And the passage I want us to look at today is found in chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Just a few verses we're going to look at today. Paul writes, Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. 
See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. Now it's an interesting passage whenever you realize He just spoke in all of chapter 1 about the magnificent power and the glory and the majesty and all that Jesus is. And then now he says, and remember, just as I've taught you, this is who we walk with now. What he's actually taking, and what I want us to look at in these few verses from uh, verse 6 through 10, he's challenging philosophy, the things of, the ways of thinking of the world. And whenever I say the things and the ways of thinking that the world has, you've got to remember we're constantly being bombarded by this. It's not only that we're trying to grow more like Jesus, but... At the same time, we're continuing to hear more and more from the world around us, and it shapes us whether we realize it or not. You noticed, uh, as a matter of fact, if you turn on the news nowadays, we see it's uh, election season, so everything generally speaks of candidates this and that. It drives me crazy every time I turn it on. And sometimes I look at it and I think to myself, I've already heard this enough. <laughs> you know. And it, At the same time, you realize it is one of those ways in which our nation is established and so it has to run its course to some degree but oh my goodness the news really takes these things sometimes and they go over them and they turn them and they regurgitate them and after a while you think to yourself okay i don't know if i can take much more of this but if you're not careful what it's doing is it's impressing upon you different ways of thought have you ever noticed that for most people in the united states even as we've done in here this morning If I were to say, let's talk about politics, the number one reaction of most people is, oh. See, you know what it did? It shaped you, didn't it? See, it shaped you. Very seldom do people say, oh, I'm interested in that. Please, let's talk about that. That's an engaging topic that I haven't dwelt on very much lately, and I'm excited to engage it once again. You don't hear that kind of attitude, do we? Sometimes we hear, though, that whenever we think about religion... It's another topic most people don't want to talk about. Whenever you go to someone and you say, Hey, I want to invite you to church. I want to talk to you about Jesus. You'll see people turn. You'll see people respond in different ways. Why? Because things shape us. Without you realizing them, they're constantly shaping us. Can I remind you, what's taught for us in Scripture is what God intends to shape us. And so we must diligently work to allow it to shape us and not only for it to shape us it continues to mold us and impress us all the way until we see him face to face speaking of Jesus and it's interesting because when Paul's writing to the church in Rome in chapter 8 he says to them that you are to constantly be conformed into the image of Jesus so we have a lot we have a long way to go don't we guys Okay, that didn't go over very well. Let's stay kind of quiet in here. We can have interactive time this morning whenever I, when I ask you a question. Okay, you good with that? It's your one free chance to talk in church. All right, think about this. In this life we have in Christ, it's tough. But God is constantly trying to shape us to be just like Jesus. Now think on this thought as we go back into the text. He says, Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Verse 1 reminds us when it comes to philosophy, philosophy cannot bring us salvation. Okay? That's the bottom line. Look at a couple of key words that Paul uses in that in verse 6. First of all, talking about Jesus, he says, Christ Jesus, the Lord. Go back, if you'll remember the Bible stories or the things that we celebrate around Christmas time, and you hear the story of the Christ child being born. You know that, that term that we see there. We realize, especially in the birth of Jesus... That He was the anointed one. That's what the picture of the Christ is telling us. He is the chosen, the anointed one. That's the reason why we celebrate so deeply the Christmas narrative that tells us. But it's kind of like Easter. We don't celebrate the death of Jesus and His resurrection just one day out of the year. We celebrate that every day out of the year. Right, guys? And we don't celebrate His birth just one day out of the year. We celebrate it every moment of every day. Because if it weren't for those two pillars of of our belief, then our life following this person named Jesus would be in vain. But no, he was born as the anointed one and he died to raise again forevermore. See, those two hold an incredible importance. So whenever we look at philosophy of this world can't bring us salvation. It can only come through the anointed one. No matter what's being pressed against us, never fail on that one thought. 
But the second term that he uses at the end of verse 6 is what? What word do you have listed in your Scripture? Christ Jesus who? The Lord. Now, whenever we think about Him being the Lord, that means that in every aspect of our, our life, He has lordship. He has leadership in it. He has authority in it. That's the reason why at the end we'll look at it in a minute, but at the end of verse 10, He says, He is the head over all rule and authority. So right now, whenever we hear of political conversations taking place, can I remind you of one thing? Yes, we live in a nation that is governed and it has its uh, political arena, but our lordship is in Christ. Amen. And he is, our, he is over all rule and authority. There's no question there. Can I ask you a question without getting uh, too difficult of a response this morning? You guys, are you with me? I'm not, I'm not trying to incite a riot. Think on this thought. Does it really matter? who is a government leader at any particular time if God is the head over all rule and authority. Now, we may think that the way the nation turns or moves is critically important, and it is. But who is in authority? He is. He is your Lord, not the government. He is your Lord, not society. He is your Lord, not any aspect of this world in which we live on because now as we have accepted Him as Savior, He's left us here for a purpose and that is to be His witnesses, Acts 1.8 tells us, as coming from the words of Jesus Himself, every place our foot covers, we are to be His witnesses. So it reminds me, philosophy of the world cannot bring salvation. It can only come through Jesus. And praise God, since June the 1st, 1996, I made the decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 29 years old I was when I finally came to Christ, although I grew up in church. But I finally came to that place where I realized He was not the Lord of my life until I turned it fully over to Him. And since I've turned it over to Him, it's been a brand new day. That's the life He leads. And that's who we follow. When we think about the philosophy of the world, don't be pressured by what's going on around you. Keep in mind, it can never bring us salvation. Jesus is the chosen one. He is the Lord, and we'll trust and follow Him. Now that brings us into an interesting conversation because trusting and following Him is a challenge to most people. But I want to remind you, whenever you think about this life that we have in Christ, everything boils down to that. Notice what he says in verse 7. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Now, I like the end of verse 7 because the end of verse 7 reminds us there's a byproduct of our faith in following Christ. And it's what? Gratitude. gratitude. Overflowing with gratitude. Sometimes we forget that little aspect, don't we? I mean, you can, get, you can turn on the news for a minute or read the newspaper or talk to a handful of your friends and neighbors and before long, <laughs> you've got your head hanging. That's not the relationship we have in Christ. As a matter of fact, it's not the things on this world that bring us the joy and the excitement, fill our hearts with gratitude. It's, it's this relationship we have with the only King of all creation. Once again, going back to Colossians chapter 1, that's why He laid all that out for us. So we remember that our joy is not attached to the things of this world, but it comes full flow from the Father Himself through the power of the Holy Spirit because of the life we have in Christ. We've got this joyful, filled with gratitude life. But what is this life about? Look with me again in verse 7. He says, Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him. Now that's important because if we talk about being in Him and rooted with Him and built up in Him, it's important for us to understand that over 72 times in the New Testament, and I use 72 because some translations spell it out a little clearer and some of them use it in a general term. But generally speaking, no matter what common translation you use of the New Testament over 72 times you're going to find in Him or in Christ Jesus or in Jesus. Do you realize that that means that the life you have now in the eyes of the Father whenever you came to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior an amazing transaction took place. That sinful nature you were born with on the moment you turned, repented of your sins believing that gospel message and say I choose to follow Christ. This transaction took place. Your sin debt, past, present and future was totally erased. It was gone away with. It was, it, was a, it was not just pushed back or hidden. It was eliminated. But even if our sin debt would have been erased, done away with past, present, and future, you'd still be lacking righteousness to stand in the presence of God, right? Because we are created and not creator, so we lack righteousness. 
That's the reason why it's important when we look at justification that the righteousness of Christ was placed on our account, right? So now you have His righteousness and you dwell in His righteousness because we have no righteousness of our own. What a beautiful concept it is to know that the moment you followed Christ, that sin debt was erased, the Holy Spirit regenerated your dead spiritual self that had separated you from God and now it has life and you have a, you have a real powerful spiritual life that's engaging God, but you are in Christ Jesus. This is an amazing life, right guys? Now how can we say, how many of y'all remember, okay, I'm going to test you a little bit. If you couldn't tell by my accent, I did not grow up in Hawaii. Okay, I'll go ahead and let that out of the back. I was asked one time by these two little boys from Texas, "Uh, are you Hawaiian? And I said, "Uh, no. They said, we didn't think so because you sound like we do. And I said, okay, that's that's good enough. But, uh, you know, whenever we we think about growing up, me growing up, I used to watch a show on television called Hee Haw. Y'all ever see? Oh, Hee Haw. Remember? Some of you might remember that. It was kind of a, a variety show that was a little country, and I don't quite know how to explain it. It was crazy. You can still find it every once in a while on late night TV. But, you know, there used to be some of these guys. They'd lean on the front porch of this old place, and they'd sing gloom, despair, and agony on me. And one of them would go, oh, and moan. And that was their song. And they talked about how terrible life was in this little skit. Well, I tell you what, we don't have that life, do we, guys? We traded that life in. Now the life we have is power-filled. And it is full of joy and gratitude because we are in Christ. There is no longer gloom, despair, and agony on me. This is good life. Have you embraced it? Okay, well, a little moderate response. I don't know, some of you, I may have caught you off guard by asking you a question. You weren't expecting me to ask you a question, maybe. I'll, I'll try it again another, a little later on. But you know what? Whenever we think about this life, notice what he says. It is firmly rooted, and it is being built up in him. And you should be, he is saying, established in your faith just as you were instructed. So he's already shared with him the truth of who Christ is, and he has already at an earlier time spent time with him. That's why he's writing back to them now. So what he's telling them, what I have taught you about this life of Christ, you need to remember. And I want to bring it down to where I said you can boil it down to two things. Think on this for a second. Your life in Christ is based on faith. Okay? We hear that over and over in Scripture. You've got a life of faith. And I'm going to tell you, you exercise faith, you and I exercise faith in every element of our life, whether you realize it or not. I flew over here this morning, Wendy and I did from Honolulu. Sitting on that plane, who am I trusting other than God? Pilot, the company that built the plane, the mechanics that are supposed to keep it up. I mean, there's a lot of trust involved, right? And that's just getting me here safely. They could have sent me off in a different direction or no telling where. We put a lot of faith in things and we don't think about it, do we? You know, I noticed today, I asked the lady even, the one who stands at the front, the flight attendant, does all the buckle, the mask, and the, you know, all that stuff. You know how they do all that same stuff over and over. I got to thinking about this. You know what? Second probably to pastor, she's one of the one she's she's one of the one people I think about. She's she's one of that crowd that I think about that has the most important message to share and not very many people ever pay attention to her. Have you ever noticed that? I asked her. I said, just a quick question, about how many people are paying attention out of this little spiel? And I think she was being kind, she said about forty percent maybe. But you know what? She's telling you some safety stuff, right? If things go wrong, you're trusting in the guy next to you to hop up and take care of it for you or maybe your instincts to kick in or something to happen. You didn't really pay attention to the lady. You kind of might be in trouble. <laughs> now, I'm just as guilty. You know, I got my earbuds in already and you know, I'm playing free cell on my phone and just kind of thinking, okay, let's get this thing moving. I'm ready to get where I want to get. She's got an important message. Now, I'm going to share one with you real quick. Your life of faith is the combination of two components, trust and obedience. An old hymn we used to sing in church when I was growing up, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You know the reason why? Because faith is a combination of trust and obedience. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to trust in the message. You have to trust in the knowledge of who God is. You have to trust when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and then you have to couple it with obedience. And you've got to obey. Because for you just to say, I believe and I hear... And I trust you is not good enough. As a matter of fact, that's why James, as he wrote his letter, he says, your faith without action is what? It's dead. See, that's not faith then, is it? If you say, I trust, but you don't obey, you're not exercising any faith. 
Now, he's talking about this faith in Christ. It's firmly rooted in Him, and now you're being built up in Him, and you're established in Him. And what he's saying is philosophy can come at you from many different directions, but first of all, it's not going to provide you salvation. It can't bring you salvation. And secondly, it can't bring you faith. Philosophy of the world cannot bring you any faith that stands justified in the eyes of God. There's only one. That's Christ. Many years ago, one of my buddies, uh, you know, I, I failed to mention this to you before. Uh, Wendy and I, I pastored Lahaina Baptist Church for many years on Maui, and uh, we were blessed to be there for, for a good while. Really enjoyed it. One of my buddies there, Big Jim, played Major League Baseball many years ago. Now he's in his 80s. He suffered several strokes. So Jim uses two canes to get around. He's still just a huge man, wonderful heart, one of the, one of the sweetest men I've ever met and known. Big Jim and I, we, we talked a lot. I remember one time Big Jim told me, he said, I never hear God like you talk about hearing God. I never hear the Holy Spirit speak to me like you talk about the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I wish I could. And I told him, I said, well, you know, it's a, it's a combination of His Word, knowing His Word. It's a combination of, of keeping your ears and your mind clear enough to hear Him and stay focused. It's, it's after you really begin to walk in Him, after you're established in Him for a length of time, you can understand, you can discern His voice, but it's not something you have to take casually and you can't live casually. You've got you to gotta be attentive. You've got to stay focused. Well, a little few minutes later on in the conversation, he's telling me about he and his wife went to a restaurant not long ago, and he said, I felt kind of bad. Here we walked in the restaurant. You know, it takes Jim a while. He, he uses two canes so he just doesn't breeze in and breeze out. And he said, as I was walking by, there was a homeless man sitting right outside the door of the restaurant. And we walked on in. And he said, whenever I got in, I thought to myself, I should have invited him to come in. I'd have bought him dinner. So he said, I got up and I walked back out there. He was gone. And I was a little saddened over it. I said, Big Jim, you tell me you don't ever hear from God. And he said, no. I said, I think you heard from him. You just didn't recognize his voice. And he said, what do you mean? I said, whenever uh, you saw that man there, I'm pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit. said, why don't you take this guy in and give him something to eat? And he said, oh, I never thought about that. He said, you know what? I take back what I said. God talks to me all the time. I just don't listen. <laughs> I said, you're absolutely right. How many of us fall into that same dilemma? You know why? It's because in this life, we have to become diligent to pursue faith, being built up and established in our faith. You as a church are seeking for God to guide you the next pastor. You need to be diligent in your trust in your obedience. You and your life, you're facing questions all around you about the workplace or school or conversations about politics and community and all kind of things. You have to exercise great faith because the world around you, philosophy is not going to build faith. You've already been given a brand new spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we're taught. You have now a full standing where you had no place in the eyes of the Father. Now you have a full standing in the eyes of the only true living God. The sustainer, the creator, the magnificent one. The one we sang about just a few moments ago. You are amazing, God. Isn't He though? Yes. And He, he is with you closer than you could ever imagine. See, the world's philosophy can't bring you any of that. So not only can it not bring you salvation, and it cannot bring you faith. Notice what he says in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world rather than according to Christ. Philosophy can't balance truth out either, can it? Have you ever noticed that? The world will tell you one story and then six months later it's changed and a person can give you one side of a situation and six months later or six weeks later or six minutes later it might change. Hey, philosophy, the things the world offer can't balance truth. And you know what we've kind of found out in our world today, which I think the United States is probably one of the strongest nations in doing this. If we don't like it, we just rewrite history. Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. hey, we just kind of rewrite stuff according to what we like. That's about as empty as you're going to find. Right now, we see nations of the world saying other nations don't even exist. We see places in this world where uh, we've been told everything's, everything from aliens to the craziest stuff you ever could imagine took place when the scientists are saying, well, you know what, really, it appears as though this was a part of creation. I mean, we got stuff taking place everywhere. And you know what the world? The world cannot balance truth. Philosophy can't balance truth, but Christ can. Notice what he says again. 
See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. That, that's a strong word, take you captive, hold you. And believe it or not, philosophy will hold you. And once it gets a hold in you, you become confused as to what the truth is, don't you? You'll, you'll start hearing one person say one thing and you'll question yourself on what you know is true. That's the reason why he says, don't follow anything than according to Christ. He says at the bottom, everything else is wrong. So, it's interesting. You're going to be faced with challenges. I can guarantee you this next week coming up, I will be too. And you know what you're going to have to answer? Whether it's the things that are rooted in Christ or the things rooted in the world. And which way are you going to move to it? I want to encourage you in this. Exercise the faith that you've been established or that you're growing in, that you've been rooted in. Exercise that faith. Be listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Know what the Word of God is truly saying to you and move forward in the way that's God's way because that will balance truth every time. That you won't find it in other places. Now, I, won't, I will encourage you not to do this. I won't tell you go out and start a, a one-man militia where you try to right all the wrongs in the world. Folks, there's no one man to solve that problem short of Jesus. Are you with me? Amen. So don't let that be your mission. Remember what your mission is. It's built upon faith, and that is knowing and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and what God would have you to do, not only for the next 10 years, but for the next 10 seconds. And be faithful to hear His voice and do what He told you to do and pursue that. And watch what God's going to do through you. Why? Because philosophy is not going to bring salvation, it's not going to build faith, and it's not going to balance truth. But He certainly will do all three of those things in our lives if we'll continue to trust Him. And that's the reason why He began by saying, Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So let that be your life and everything that you do. Walk in Him. Finally, you won't find the philosophies of the world bringing deity, godness, Notice verse 9 and 10. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That means there is zero godliness, zero deity that is outside of Jesus. Now, if you want to challenge people, let that be a statement out of your mouth in the culture and society of our world today. Oh, you've got people saying, whoop, 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 no. You know, used to one of the, my favorite things to do whenever we lived in Lahaina, uh, obviously we had lots of visitors come through uh, West Maui. A lot of times, usually it was on Thursdays. That was one day I'd try to set aside. I'd leave the office. I'd take a little clipboard with me with a couple of questionnaires because they always stir conversations. You, hey, think about it. You ask somebody, can I get your opinion on something? Psst, it don't matter what it is. They're going to give you an opinion. So, hey, if you're ever a little skittish about starting a conversation with somebody, ask them what their opinion is. Oh, they'll, they'll just they'll, they'll get right out of the way. They'll talk to you right away. So I'd take this little survey, and I'd, I'd go down on Front Street, down around the Banyan Tree, up and down through where I see a lot of tourists, but also a lot of local folks, and I'd say, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, sure. Now, they may be late for dinner or well watch or whatever, but chances are you say, can I ask you a couple of questions? They're going to stop. And I'd say, I'm asking a couple of questions today. I'm doing a little bit of a survey. Find out what people think about church. Oh, okay. Well, they'll get all ready and get, uh, okay, here we go. Do you think people go to church as often as they did 20 years ago? Almost everybody says no. Say, uh, do you feel as people read the Bible or trust in the Bible as much as they did 20 years ago? Almost everybody says no. Now, usually say, uh, uh, do you believe in a place called heaven? Yes. That, that, that answer is almost always yes. doesn't matter... Whether or not they want to believe the Bible, most people believe there's another place we're going to go one day when we die. Okay? And I'd usually say, what do you think, in your opinion, it takes to get to heaven? Okay, here's where you start seeing a separation, okay? Usually about 25% of the people say, trust in Jesus or something along those lines. Okay? About 20, 25% of the people. About 25% of the people say stuff that's way out on the fringe somewhere. And that's where I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know what? I, I believe that uh, you know, aliens can take us there or, you know, one day we're all just going to into light and we'll end up there. And you hear all kind of stuff and you just kind of smile and write those things down. And, you know, in your brain you're thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't know what it's... But you just, you know. And usually about 50% of the people say one other answer. You want to take a guess at what that other answer is? 
25% say trust in Jesus. 25% say something that's way out in the left field. Be a good person. That's the other 50%. Be a good person. That's what the majority of people say. Be a good person. So whenever I say, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And the vast majority of people, 75% of them don't know anything or say anything about Jesus. The following question is, do you mind if I tell you what the Bible says? Now see, there's where you have your opportunity to talk with them. You'd be shocked at the number of people whenever you don't give them your opinion, but you tell them what the Bible says, just simply. Take about 30 seconds, show them a couple of things about the Bible and point and tell them, you know what, Jesus is fully God, according to God's Word. And He wants to give you life. You can't access Him in any other way. You'll catch people's attention. Now, very few of them will follow you through but God can use you to plant seeds and God can use you to challenge. You know why? Because there is not deity found anywhere else in anything else of the world. The fullness dwells in Christ. That's according to God's plan. You know, a lot of times I'd ask them, uh, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? they give me that answer. i say, do you mind what the Bible, uh, if I share with you what the Bible says? Sometimes they'll say, no, I'm not interested. And I say, well, yeah, I find it kind of interesting, too, that uh, you're willing to go to a place that God created, but you don't want to know His requirements to get in. And then they usually say, well, I guess I'll reason that out when the time comes. Well, pray you'll find a way. Now, I, I may talk about that with us in here, but I want to encourage you, this message is not one that we just hear and then we go off on our way. God's Word's always working to activate us and to, to, to grow us in greater ways. And I want to challenge you. I, I want to challenge you in just these handful of verses to be mindful that people are constantly being pressured and attacked by the things of this world. And they need to hear the truth in the Word of God. They need to hear it with compassion. They need to hear it with patience. They need to hear it with understanding. And I challenge you. Just continue to let it be a part of your life every day. Talk to somebody. Watch what God will do. It's amazing. This world is hungry. Statistically speaking, as a matter of fact, not only Pew Research, but also Lifeway Research has shown us and some studies that have taken place in the last five years, 75% of friends and family of people in the United States that were uh, surveyed, 75% of their friends and family members said they'd come to church if that friend or family member invited them to. Do you realize that over 60% of the world around us will come to a Bible study in your home if you invited them to just a simple Bible study in your home? Over 60% of the people in the United States said they would come to that. Now you may say, well, I've asked my family members and I've asked others and they keep telling me no. Don't let that uh, discourage you. The world around you it is not anti-God. They just have a lot of questions and a lot of times when they come into a place, if they don't feel welcome or if they don't understand what's going on, then that puts a bad impression in them. And the very next time somebody asks them to come back, they'll think to themselves, well, I really wasn't greeted, I really didn't connect with anybody, and I didn't really understand because there was a lot of church stuff going on, and I'm not a part of that, I wish I was closer. You'll hear those kind of statements made. People aren't just saying, I don't want anything to do with God. Now, you do have that percentage. But 75% of your friends and family members and over 60% of the community around you would be willing to engage if you'll go to them. See, that's because Jesus is our life. This is God. This is real stuff. I love, again, whenever he says, and in him, speaking of Jesus, the whole glorious total of what God is is summed up in him. And in him, you have been made complete. Now, think about that because if I just said the things of the world are empty in all these other areas, and then I said that Jesus fills all these other areas. You know, it's kind of sometimes preaching to the choir. It's the people who should already know these things in a sense that we talk to among these things. But you know what? It presses against us too, doesn't it, guys? And it pushes us sometimes and it sways us and it causes us to hesitate or hold back. But let me remind you of this. In Him you are complete. Is there anything that this world can throw against us that will break us? No, not at all. Are there some things that will put us down on our knees and set us back a little bit? Yes. But in Him, you're complete. And He overcame this world, and so Scripture teaches us that we do as well. And it's not just that one day when we die, we'll all go to heaven if we've trusted Jesus. It's in this life now, if we'll pursue His will, 
Once again, it doesn't mean life's going to be easy or everything's going to work our way, but I can guarantee you where He leads you, He has a sure plan and you're complete as you continue to trust in Him even if it takes us to our death. He makes us complete. And we can trust Him fully. No greater place to be in life, even in spite of the beautiful locations we all call home, no greater place to be in this life than dead in the center of God's will. Each step, each moment, and that grand opportunity is given to us each moment of each day. It's given to us. Are you walking in Christ? That's where Paul began this little piece. Have you been reminded lately that you're complete in Him? Things of the world are going to press you. Stay firm. Continue to trust and grow in Him as you've been established. And watch Him do the incredible things around you, in you, and through you. And remember... He is head over all rule and authority. I'll tell you what, when I think about the life we have in Christ, there's a lot of people in this world that are looking for the meaning of life, aren't they? As a matter of fact, uh, not long ago, Wendy and I were on a plane. We were coming back from the mainland. There was a young couple sitting in front of us. They were coming to your town. At least that's what they said to all the other people that were traveling around them in the airplane. They were talking about, oh, we're coming, we're moving to Hawaii. We feel like this is what God wants. We came here on our anniversary and we're coming. I noticed uh, one time she got up off the plane, the young lady did, the wife, and she had a book in her hand. It was a world religion healing technique. And I thought to myself, she's pursuing a lot of stuff. I heard her telling the people around us that she was coming over here to to plug into some kind of a training thing that goes on so that she can learn how to do this uh, spiritual he healing thing in a different way. And you know what was interesting? She was coming. She and her husband, they were coming. And they appeared to be solid in the fact that there was something else that they really needed to find in life. They said that over and over again. Guys, we need to make sure people understand you're only complete in Christ. He fulfills everything in your life because they're being bombarded from all angles. Yet we have the truth. Maybe a time coming soon you're going to get on an airplane. Whenever you buckle your seat and they close that door, the music kind of dims down, the lady's going to stand in the middle of the aisle and she's going to have a seat belt in one hand and a mask in the other hand going to have a flotation device sitting down there in front of her and a little card off to the side and she's going to go through that little routine that probably all of us have seen a handful of times. I want you to think about the importance of the message she's trying to share. That's, that's important stuff. God forbid this plane go down. I want to know exactly what she told me to do. And I know there's other people trusting in that. We may take it for granted sometimes. We may just listen to it and it just kind of roll through our heads and not even consider. But that's an extremely important message, isn't it? Can I explain to you just in one more second? It pales in comparison to the message of Jesus. Because one may save you physically, but Christ is the only way to save you eternally. Amen. Church, I love you. I thank you for the time you've given me today. And as we get ready to transition, I turn it back over to the praise team. Maybe God's spoken to you about something today. Maybe He's trying to remind you not to be pressured by the news and don't let those things throw you in a tailspin. Trust in Him. Or maybe you've got friends and family members you know that are challenged in this life and they need the reassurance of someone who's rooted in Christ to guide them. Maybe you know someone who needs to hear the message. Or maybe you've just been struggling in your faith and you needed to be reminded that it's trust and obey moment by moment, day by day. Whatever it is, will you join with me in just a moment of prayer? And I want to give you a chance to respond if God's talking to you about something. Whatever it is, I invite you to take it up with Him for just these next couple of moments. Whatever it is. As we begin this time, I just want to uh, ask that you join with me in a in a quiet moment of prayer, and then in just a moment I'll pray and we'll transition to the praise team.
As you just join with me with your heads bowed for a second, I want to pray for you. If you know God spoke to you about something this morning, maybe just lift your hand or, or look at me, let me know. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to say, if God spoke to you about something, I just want to pray for you. That's it. I'm not going to hunt you down later. I just want to pray for you. That's all. Thank you, guys. All I want to do is pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Join with me in prayer. Father God, you know our hearts. Holy Spirit, you've been speaking to us. There's nothing in our lives that will ever catch you by surprise. So when we come to you, strengthen us now, Holy Spirit, to open ourselves up to you. You know us better than we know ourselves. As you're speaking to us now, and even some have, have acknowledged that this morning, as you're speaking to us now, Holy Spirit, we come to you and we ask for you to work in that thing that you've spoken to us about. And strengthen us now to say yes to whatever it is you're telling us. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit. Father, we're thankful that you have laid out an incredible plan for us. And Lord Jesus, we celebrate the fact that you were willing to go to the degree that you did for us. Because what you did for us has given us this life. So we thank you and we praise you. And now as we have heard of you, as we've been taught... As we are in you now, strengthen us. Bless us now as we continue this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.